And I invite you this morning to turn to the Gospel of Luke once again. This time to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 41. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 41. Uh, We're skipping ahead a little in Luke because I want to start a short series within Luke on prayer and our life with Jesus. And I thought I would start this series off with my favorite analogy for the Christian life. It comes from Bernard of Clairvaux. He was talking to his fellow 12th century monks about how to have a healthy ministry. And he said to them, you are called to give those around you the water of life. You're called to give people Jesus and to serve them and love them in Jesus' name. Now, water gets to people in one of two ways, Bernard says. It comes through canals or wells. And kids, in Bernard's day, at least where he was living, canals were basically open-air plumbing that connected a nearby lake to a town. And what the town would do is they'd have someone go out in the morning and they'd open up the dam, they'd open up a door to the lake, and the water would rush down this canal to some holding tanks, which the townspeople would then use to, uh, for their water morning and evening. And then once those holding tanks were full, They would close the door to the dam, and the water, the canal, would be empty of water. Bernard told his students, you have two choices. You can be a canal, which is full only when water is passing through it, but empty the rest of the time. Or you can be a well, which is always full of water, and which can be drawn from over and over and over again without getting empty. Be a well, Bernard said. Don't be a canal. Be so full of life with Jesus that when you minister to others, they get what they need from you without leaving you empty and dry. Isn't that a beautiful image? But is it possible? Yes, And that's what this five-part sermon mini-series is all about. And it starts in our passage with this well-known story of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha being upset that Mary wasn't helping her. Uh, Now, I know this story is not a favorite of most people because we tend to feel guilty for being too much like Martha, busy, overwhelmed, anxious, but we don't know how to be like Mary. And so we feel bad and we feel hopeless. Uh, This morning, I want us to leave feeling hopeful and eager. I want us to leave this morning convinced that we can have this abundant, overflowing life from Jesus, so much so that we can pour ourselves out into the lives of others without becoming empty ourselves. I, I want us to leave this morning knowing how to drill the wells of our hearts deeply into the grace and person of Jesus. And so let's read our passage. Let's ask Jesus to help us, because he's the only one who can do this. And then let's hear how to have this kind of abundant life with Christ. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him, and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Thus far the reading of God's own word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to choose the good portion. But Lord, we know that our ability to choose it, 
Our ability to learn how to choose it and to persevere in choosing it is something that can only be accomplished if your Spirit writes your Word on our heart and then produces life through that Word in us. And so, Father, we pray that you would therefore send your Spirit now to bless us, to give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe your Word. Father, may the mouth, words of my mouth as your preacher, may the meditation of all our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word, may it all now be pleasing in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in order to understand the two different choices that Mary and Martha make, it's helpful to know what's been going on for the last couple of months before this in the Gospel of Luke. We stopped at the end of chapter 7, but at the beginning of chapter 8, we meet a number of women Mary and, and Martha among them, who joined Jesus as his disciples. And I'm just going to add this in passing. Most of the women mes- mentioned there at the beginning of Luke chapter 8, uh, by name, were wealthy and influential. They were actually most likely major funders of Jesus' ministry. They're a big reason, maybe even the main reason, why Jesus could go and preach and teach full-time rather than having to work as a carpenter. And in one of the great ironies, I'll just throw this out there as well, uh, the, uh, there's a servant in Herod's house, um, someone who's named the wife of Cleopas, the wife of Chusa. She's one of the big funders of Jesus' ministry. So Herod was paying Jesus through his relative to preach the gospel, which I think is fantastic. That's kind of beside the point, though. Uh, these women were there when Jesus starts teaching in the very next section in chapter 8 about how God's people need to devote themselves to the ministry of the gospel. They were there when Jesus taught them the parable of the sower, which is about our need to receive the word of God and then to have it bear fruit in our lives, in the world. They were there when Jesus talks in chapter 8 about not hiding our light under a jar, but letting it shine in front of the whole world. And they heard him say, to his biological mother and to his brothers and sisters, that my family are the ones who hear the word of God and do it. They were there in chapter 9 when Jesus sent out the 12 disciples to preach the gospel to as many towns as possible. They heard Jesus define discipleship as denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following after him. And then they were there also just before our passage, when he sent out the 72 disciples to preach the gospel to towns all over Galilee and Israel. Our story takes place the same day or maybe a few days after those 72 disciples return, celebrating what God has done through them, hearing Jesus celebrate with them, and then hearing Jesus connect the gospel ministry and gospel service to the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is the one who stopped and acted out of love. So for the last few months, Martha and Mary, the disciples, they have had the, what Paul calls the privilege of spending and being spent in the service of Christ. They've had this months-long season of devoted, energetic, fruitful, probably tiring ministry for Jesus as he's hammering home the point over and over again about the need to go out and minister and serve and evangelize and do God's word. And in that, it might sound uh, a little like what we want for our lives or maybe what our lives have have been, Uh, a day in, day out season of spending and being spent in the service of Jesus, trying by faith to bear the gospel fruit of love and evangelism and service to Jesus wherever we are. Uh, That's what was happening with Martha and Mary. But in response to this uh, frenetic, active, sacrificial giving ministry, Martha and Mary have two different responses during this break period, don't they? Martha, who we'll talk more about in a second, refuses the needed opportunity to rest and be with Jesus, and receive just a little more life from him. Whereas Mary realizes that she needs to be with Jesus if she is going to serve him and takes this opportunity then to receive life from him. Here's how we see that. 
Notice in our passage that Jesus is called Lord a few times. In verse 39, we're told that Mary sat at the Lord's feet. In verse 40, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, do you not care? And in verse 41, we're told, but the Lord answered her. And I don't think Lord here is just a reference to Jesus' divinity since the context is about working and resting. I think this is a reference back to Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, if you go back and you reread Luke's gospel up to this point, you'll find that Jesus is called Lord whenever there's a particularly important moment of salvation. He's the Lord who sets the captives free. The Lord who frees people from demonic oppression. And then you'll also hear him called Lord whenever there's a moment of rest. Or as we saw a few weeks ago, whenever God needs to defend his people's rest, right? That's when he's called the Lord of the Sabbath. Now take that observation that Jesus is called Lord repeatedly in our passage. Take the context of working and resting and look and see what Mary is doing. In verse 39, we're told that she has parked herself right in front of Jesus at his feet. She's sitting at his feet. She's listening to him. And remember, as we heard uh, about our Sabbath rest with, rest with Jesus, it's life, delight, and communion with God. Mary is communing with Jesus. She's parked herself in conversation with Jesus. She's listening to his word. She's probably asking him questions, but she's also just enjoying his company. She is here a disciple with her teacher, a sinner with her savior, and a friend with her trusted and trustworthy companion. She's getting a little bit of Sabbath rest. She's getting life from Jesus. She is drilling the well of her heart deep down into the grace and person of Christ so that when she needs to go out and serve, more of the waters of the gospel will overflow from her without leaving her empty. See, I think Mary here is modeling for us the practice of regular, daily Sabbath, where we sit with Jesus as sinners who need to be forgiven, as friends who need companionship and understanding, as disciples who need instruction, as wells that need to be drilled deeper so that the water of Christ's own life can quench our thirst and the thirst of our neighbor at the same time without leaving anyone dry. Now, with that said, let me add this. I don't want us to think that private prayer or individual prayer can replace an actual Sabbath day or the actual corporate worship of God's people. And that's not what Mary is modeling here. These things are just not interchangeable any more than a two-week vacation can be replaced by two days off. Or a 10-minute FaceTime call with a family or friend can replace a three-hour face-to-face chat sitting outside in the spring sunshine, which must be coming soon. Please, Jesus. Um, And I should say this, too. It's It's also not that one of these is better than the other, but it's that they each have a different role in our lives. We need weekly days off. God says so. That's why he gave us Sabbath. But we also need longer times of rest, two weeks of vacation, or if you look at the Old Testament, weeks of festivals and holidays and times of rest. The same is true of FaceTime calls, right? You need these kind of regular 10-minute conversations to keep up with people you love, but you also need these longer physical times together so that that relationship can grow even deeper See, it's not that one is better than the other. It's not that one can replace the other. You need both. And the same is true of our weekly Sabbath day, our weekly worship time, and our individual daily times of rest and Sabbath with God. We need both if we are to be wells overflowing with the waters of Christ's own life. We need both if we are going to have the immeasurably profound life, delight, and communion with Christ that Jesus has for us, pouring out of us as water can from a well that's been drilled so deep 
but the walls aren't high enough to maintain it inside, right? This overflowing well of water. So you see what Mary is getting here is a Sabbath in the middle of a day, maybe in the middle of the week, during a very intense season of ministry. And that brings us then to Martha. And what I think is going on with Mar- Martha is something very ironic. It's almost tragic. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. Distracted from what? Distracted from who? From Jesus. Right? All of the serving that she's doing is taking her away from this opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet and get life. Now, it's worth noting there's two different words for distracted used in our text this morning. The word used in verse 40 means distracted by busyness. So, have you ever come home and has someone said to you, hey, did you pick up the thing from the store that I asked you to pick up? And you say, what? They said, the thing from the store. Did you get it? Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I looked right at you, and I asked you to get the thing from the store, and you said, okay. And then you realized that you hadn't actually been listening because you were walking back and forth from one room to another, getting ready to leave. You're turning off lights. You're thinking about other things you were going to do, the things that were coming up. You were distracted by busyness. That's the same idea here. Jesus is talking. He's listening. And Martha is walking back and forth across the house. Maybe she's even responding from time to time over her shoulder. Oh yeah, that's a good point. But she's not listening. She isn't paying attention. She she isn't taking a break to be still at Jesus' feet. And listen. And that's, you know, understandable. She's invited Jesus over. Surely now is the time to be serving and preparing and working. And after all, hasn't Jesus spent like a couple months talking about the need to serve and work and do and shine and minister? And he's so happy when we accomplish things in his name. And so she she goes to Jesus in verse 40 and she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. And you can see here the expectation that, of course, Jesus cares because he's been focused so much on service throughout his time with them for the last few weeks. And she's telling him, I'm trying to serve you. Why why are you not making other people help me? This is an understandable reaction. We also know what it means to get so locked into serving Jesus that we neglect our need to be served by Jesus. And we also know what it means to get so locked into service that when other Christians don't neglect their time to be served by Jesus, we can be a little grumpy about it. Here I am serving Jesus in his name and they're spending time with him in prayer. Like, what is happening? Get out here and help me. We don't say it exactly that way, but that's kind of what happens. Now, what makes this even more ironic, and this is where I think it actually becomes borderline tragic, is when we remember verse 38 telling us this was Martha's house. She'd invited Jesus over, but she wasn't spending time with him. She'd created this opportunity to spend time with Jesus, but instead of using that opportunity to sit and listen and talk, she spent it serving Jesus instead. She's running around Jesus, rather than sitting with Jesus at his feet, listening to him, talking to him, enjoying his company, his friendship, his presence. My friends, if I can put it this way, and I understand this is not necessarily the most theologically accurate way to put it. It's not the most theologically accurate way to put it, but I'm going to use it because it connects well with this. When we invite Jesus into our lives, And I know that's not exactly how it works. But when we do that, we spend all of this time trying to serve him, but we sometimes spend very little time being served by him. 
We run from one thing to another in an effort to give him as much as we can because we love him and we want to please him, but then we don't spend time to sit at his feet and rest and receive the life that he has for us. The life that he said he came to give us abundantly. And and it's so easy to get into this pattern. There's so many things to do. There's so much ministry to accomplish. There's so many who need uh, the love of Christ. There's so many who need to hear his word. There's, There's so much to do that we become distracted by it. And then we lose sight of Jesus, who's metaphorically sitting on the couch in our house as we're running back and forth over our shoulder. Hi, hi, Jesus. I'm going to be over here real quick. Now I'm going to be over there. And when that happens, we lose perspective. And we hear him talking in the background. We hear him talking to us in the worship service. We hear him talking to us on the radio if we listen to Christian radio or YouTube or Instagram when the, you know, the the encouraging posters come up with the Bible verses on them. Or even when people are reading the Bible at home. We're going, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, amen, that's great. But we're not listening. We're not stopping. We're distracted. We're not resting and receiving Jesus' delight in us. When is the last time you've sat down in your favorite chair, opened the Bible, and received the fact that Jesus delights in you? That he rejoices in your presence in his life? When's the last time you've sat down and received the joy he has in having forgiven your sins and pouring out blessings for you daily? When's the last time you've sat and enjoyed just the fact of your forgiveness with Christ or his compassion or his strength. Beloved, when we don't spend time with Jesus, we end up losing perspective and we start thinking that all of this ministry that Jesus is calling us to do, that he wants us to do, that he's invited us into, that it's all on us. That it's in our hands, not Jesus' hands. And we start thinking of ourselves as the ones that all of his kingdom work depends on. And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. And, and then we're, we're looking at all of our relationships and everything that has to happen only in terms of ourselves. And the only things we're repeating to ourselves over and over again are questions like, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to help this? How can I carry this? How can I fix this? It's all I, me, and it crushes us. And we're no longer putting it in relationship to Jesus, sitting back and saying, Jesus, what are you doing about this right now? Because you're here. Where are you? What are you doing? We're not saying, Jesus, can you please help me? Because I am too weak, but you're not. Can you please carry this for me? I'm tired. I need to rest. Give me Sabbath, and you do it. See, Martha had become distracted from Jesus, and that distraction was stealing away from her an opportunity for Sabbath, for life, delight, and communion with God. And then, out of her own frustration, she basically asked Jesus to stop giving Mary a Sabbath and to send her out to work with her. Uh, And I put it that way because of what Jesus says in response in verse 41. He says, Martha, Martha, um, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Uh, I want to get to the the practical tips for taking regular daily Sabbath. So I'm just going to say a couple brief things here, but I think they're important. First, I want us to notice that Jesus compassionately acknowledges her preoccupation. He says that she's anxious and troubled about many things. And the word translated as as anxious means to repeat things to yourself, usually in your head. We might translate this as obsess today. 
It's constantly going over what happened, what needs to happen, what's going to happen, how is it going to happen, what is it going to get done? Does this sound like your life? It's this internal repetition of events and things that are going on and went on and need to happen. And then she's troubled. And by troubled, that don't understand it as angry. Understand it as bothered or weighed down, burdened. Maybe a better translation for us today would be stressed. Mary is obsessing and stressing. And by acknowledging this, Jesus is not saying that her concerns are illegitimate. He isn't disagreeing with her that these things need to get done. He is not saying food's not important, serving isn't important, ministry's not important. He's acknowledging their importance and he's recognizing the weight that it's putting on her shoulders and he's understanding why she's running through everything because these things require thought and practice and intention. But then he says to Martha, there is one thing necessary. There is one thing that needs to happen. More than food getting on the table. More than service. More than ministry. More than preaching the gospel. One thing is necessary. And that is to be with Jesus and receive his Sabbath rest. The one thing necessary is to get life and delight and communion with God from Christ. And then he says something at the end that really hit me very hard this week, and I've been trying to take this truth into my own heart so that I can put it into practice. This is something that I needed to hear. I think it's probably something you all need to hear. It's I want you to notice that Jesus also says that the good portion which Mary chose, which is time with Christ, will not be taken away from her. Now that could mean two things, probably means both these things. One thing it can mean is that you can't have your relationship with Jesus ripped away from you. Uh, and that's basic Christianity, and it's this beautiful reminder of our security with Christ. But, but I think if that's all it means, it doesn't really answer Martha's demand, which is that Mary come help her now. I mean, after all, why would being assured of life with Jesus in heaven excuse Mary from serving now? And why would it also act as an invitation to Martha to join them in the one thing necessary, which is to get Sabbath life from Jesus now, today? I mean, if the only thing Jesus meant by this is, hey, there's rest coming in the future, why wouldn't Martha tell Jesus what my friends and I used to tell each other in high school? She can rest when she's dead. Come help me out right now. <laughs> like, I don't understand. No, I think Jesus' point here is more than simply an assurance that we get life with Jesus forever in heaven. What I think Jesus is saying is, I will not let the demands of service rob my people of their need to spend time with me. Jesus is telling Martha as the Lord of a Sabbath, the one who protects his people's life, delight, and communion with God, I will not let the demands of service and ministry rob you of your need for rest. I will not let you be punished for taking time out to be with me by the things that you didn't do because you were with me. Things are not going to fall apart in flames and disaster if you spend time with me. The good portion will not be taken away from her or you. So my friends, what this means is if we choose to spend time with Jesus, we won't suffer or be punished by the things that are left undone while we do it. Because Jesus actively today protects his people's Sabbath as the Lord of a Sabbath in the real world, in your real lives. Meaning that when we hear Satan's lies or our own hearts tell us that the things that matter can't really be left until they're finished, and by the way, they're never finished, or that they're just too urgent to leave for a few minutes or even 30 minutes to be with Jesus, we need to hear Jesus tell us, I won't let anything 
punish you or drag you away from our time together. This time together is the one thing necessary. It's the one thing that matters most in this life. It's the thing that Jesus came to give us. It's the thing we're offering to people in the gospel, life, delight, and communion with God. Like, this is what we're offering them. Friendship with Jesus, Sabbath rest, peace. And it's what Jesus is offering us. This, this time with Jesus is the thing that is necessary for us to. It's necessary to making us be wells and not canals. And it's necessary to service. It's necessary to discipleship. It's necessary to being a prophetic sign to a world that is so busy that life, delight, and communion with God and rest and peace and all of that are found at the feet of Jesus. Not in hurry, burly, worry, as someone in uh, uh, Wind in the Willow says, but in rest in Christ. And so with that, I want to end with some practical tips on staying connected to Jesus. This won't be long, and I'm going to try and bring these in and a few others over the next few sermons. But here are some tips because I want you to be able to go out and put this into practice. So first, I know this is going to be a little bit of a stretch of interpretation, but it's going to work. It's going to be okay. First, just like Martha invited Jesus into her home, invite Jesus into your calendar. (laughs) Take frequent time during the week, once a day, to sit and receive Sabbath rest from Jesus in prayer. Now, when you do that, it's up to you. Some of it, will, you will find it beneficial to do it in the morning, some at night, some at lunch. Some of you will need to do it at some random time in the day. Uh, some of you will be able to do it at regular hours. Some of you will need to move it around because of what your schedule looks like. But whatever it is, invite Jesus into your calendar once a day. And the second thing I want to say is, Don't worry about how long the appointment is. Don't worry about the length of time. Pray and let the length take care of itself. If it's five minutes, great. If it's 50 minutes, great. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you take time every day to be a sinner before a savior, a servant before your master, a son or a daughter, with your heavenly Father. Don't worry about the length of time. Just do it. Third, uh, read something out loud from the Bible to start. Uh, I usually use the Psalms for this. You can read anything. But my advice to you is, don't make this a part of your reading plan. Right? If you're trying to read so many chapters a day or whatever, that's really important. You should do that. It gets us familiar with the Bible. Let this be different. This time is different. Read to listen. Read out loud slowly. And when something strikes you, stop and talk to Jesus about it. Like when I read, God's mercy is unrestrained towards us. I stopped and I said, Jesus, this is amazing. I don't know if I believe it. And I sort of just talk to him about that for a few minutes, and then I moved on with my reading. Maybe nothing strikes you. That's okay. Tell Jesus thank you for his word because you know he's given you something that you'll need soon, but you don't know when. Read, listen, talk in prayer, and then if it it turns into, as I'm sure it will, prayer for other people, prayer for your family, go with it. And when you run out of things to say or you realize you're starting to just repeat yourself over and over again, say amen and move on. Go about your day. Um, Fourth and finally, when you do this, and I hope you start doing this today, you're going to hear your mind tell you, as mine does, all the time, you don't have time for this. There's ministry to do. You're going to get distracted by busyness. That's okay. Okay. Respond with faith. Do what Jesus did and speak the words of Scripture to the doubts of your heart and to the temptations of Satan. Tell him, tell your heart, the good portion will not be taken away from me. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. 
And then apply this also, I hope, to Sunday worship. Sometimes we wake up, especially when the clock changes, and we can think to ourselves, I don't have time for two hours of worship this week. One thing is necessary. This is the good portion. Jesus will not let it be taken away from you. Because Jesus is the Lord of a Sabbath who doesn't want us to be canals. He wants us to be wells that are overflowing with the life that he is pouring into us by his Holy Spirit. So let's take this practice of regular daily Sabbath rest and let's put it into our lives so that we can experience the abundant life of Christ as it flows out of us into other people without leaving us dry, but full of his love and joy. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you want to give us these regular times of Sabbath rest with you. Uh, Thank you for protecting those times for us so that we can enter into them without fear. Help us, we ask, to set aside the time we need each day to be with you in prayer and fellowship. Please help us to believe your promise to give us rest and to keep us from suffering loss during these times so that we can enter into these moments with joy and confidence. Please make us to be a people of prayer. Please give us the blessing of being wells that the life of Christ can overflow from without leaving us dry. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and for the sake of his name which we received in our baptism. Amen.